Today we're going to talk about uh, recommendations from the state of Hawaii regarding uh, ocean users applying only reef safe sunscreens and what that means for the future. A compound commonly found in popular sunscreen products has been shown to cause serious harm to corals and the Department of Land and Natural Resources is now asking all ocean users to avoid sunscreens that contain oxybenzone as an active ingredient. Scientific studies suggest that this chemical causes deformities in coral larvae, making them unable to swim, settle out, and to form new coral colonies. This also increases the rate at which bleaching occurs and reduces coral resiliency to climate change. We have uh, four great speakers, uh, and what I'm going to ask them to do is do their presentations, and then if we could hold questions until everyone's done, and just please direct your questions to the individual that you would uh, like to. Uh, we're going to start uh, with, from my left, Dr. Uh, Bob Richmond, who's a research professor at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and is the director of the Kualo Basin Marine Laboratory. I hope I got that right, Bob. Kualo Marine Lab, but yeah, close. Okay. And then Alton Miyasake, who's an aquatics biologist with the DLNR Division of Aquatic Resources, followed by Jeff Bagshaw, who is a specialist uh, with the DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife at the Ahihi Kinao Natural Area Reserve on Maui and has done some outstanding uh, outreach work on this issue over there. And last but not least, Senator Will Espero from the Hawaii State Legislator, Le Legislature, who's going to talk to us about some uh, plans he has for the next legislative session starting in uh, January 2017. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Bob Richmond. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so full disclosure, I'm not Craig Downs. Um, I work with him, we're colleagues, but uh, if you see us together and you have us confused, he's the better looking one with a more charming personality. So uh, we're easy to separate. Um, Craig Downs and his colleagues have done some very important research and what they've asked me to do is step in today and uh, be the science guy to talk a little bit about it. And I'll start with just a section from what we call the Geek Sheet. Um, if you go to the National Institutes of Health website, um, they have sheets like this on just about every substance known that's been tested. And the two things that just pop right off, uh, right out of the very beginning, is the two warnings. The first, that it's very toxic to aquatic life, and second, that it's very toxic to aquatic life with long-lasting effects. So again, it's no real surprise based on just what's known of the chemistry um, that uh, there has been an issue. And Craig was one of the first ones to take this on with his colleagues. And basically, there were three kinds of things that they saw. A deformity of the coral seed or the coral planula larvae, uh, coral cell death when they were using just coral cells alone, and then actual impacts on the ability of corals to reproduce along with it. The reason I put this one slide up there is to look at the numbers uh, that are for deformities, uh, coral cell death, and you'll see that those are below the range that's really out there. So at the bottom, you can see that the range for the U.S. Virgin Islands was from 75 micrograms per liter to over uh, 1.4 milligrams per liter. That's a thousand-fold higher. And the same for Hawaii, that it's in the range in which it's effective. So that's one of the first questions scientists always ask. It doesn't matter necessarily if a chemical has a bad effect, if it's at an unreasonable level. Um, but uh, Craig's work has shown is that it is present in the environment around coral reefs at levels that we know uh, it is having an effect. Um, so the kinds of effects that Craig and his colleagues found were pretty straightforward. Uh, coral bleaching, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with, more to do with climate change, and that is the breakdown of the essential uh, relationship between uh, small algal cells that live inside of the coral animal, a coral host, uh, that provide over 90% of its daily energy. Corals are basically solar powered. And when this very important relationship breaks down due to stress, uh, the corals lose a major uh, source of their nutrition. And in some cases, and usually in many cases, the coral will eventually die if it can't reacquire uh, those symbiotic algal cells. Um, at a time when coral bleaching has been going on, this is the third year in a row uh, 2014 was the first major coral bleaching event we saw recently in Hawaii. Uh, hit again in 2015. Um, I was just in Palau last week and it started there and we're expecting it to be again September, October in Hawaii. And now the predictions are to go into 2017. Uh, for many of us who uh, deal with coral reefs and climate change, it's a huge issue because this is the most long-lasting and extensive coral bleaching series in recorded history. And when you add other stressors that cause coral bleaching, it affects the ability of corals to be resilient. Um, in addition, at the uh, cellular level, 
Um, Craig and his colleagues have found DNA damage, and that affects the ability of corals not only to survive, but also to reproduce. When DNA is damaged, it affects their egg production, the sperm production, and the ability of eggs to be fertilized by sperm and spawning, and uh, the result is a loss of reproductive success. Um, it is an endocrine disruptor, uh, like many other chemicals in the environment, including plasticizers. And it turns out that corals do have a, a hormonal system, a protein system, um, that does function on things like estrogen. So when you do get these endocrine disruptors out there, they can affect reproduction in corals. Um, unfortunately, in the olden days, when I started coral reef work 42 years ago, uh, the main index or the main indicator of stress was death. And uh, we've been able to do a lot better. If you uh, think if we just use death as the indicator of stress in people, nobody would be arguing about Obamacare. You'd have either live people or dead people and nothing in between. And the same goes for corals, that uh, death is a very crude estimator of stress. And we've been able to move forward. And by looking at the effects, including the lack of reproduction, you can go to a reef that has a lot of big old corals. But if you don't see the young ones, the five-year-olds, four-year-olds, three-year-olds, you know that reef is essentially dead. It's just a matter of time. Um, as we've mentioned already, that it causes uh, juvenile uh, deformation of the coral larvae. And so when you begin to impact the very uh, function of being able to regenerate reefs through the reproductive process, um, the result we know is going to lead to the uh, eventual loss of those reefs and areas uh, that it seeds as well. Um, specifically, the oxybenzone does reduce resilience to climate change. So um, it's often what we call death by a thousand cuts. It may not be just one stressor alone. And rarely do we go to a reef that is just a single stressor. Normally, it's multiple stressors. Sedimentation in Hawaii is big. Coastal pollution, you add elevated uh, temperature events like this, and it makes it much harder for the corals to bounce back. Um, the death of coral planula, the uh, larvae that come in, so even if they're formed in a pristine area, um, when they come into an area of reduced water quality, they can die and simply be unable to settle. Um, the ability of what um, uh, Craig has called these zombie reefs, the ability to reproduce is lost. So you do have reefs that are there, you have corals that are there, but for all intents and purposes, they're no longer fully capable of functioning as a living organism, including reproduction. And another point he wanted to make, and some of you may be familiar with the recent news about microbeads in facial scrubbers. I don't have to worry about facial scrubbers, obviously, uh, but for those of you that do, the microbeads and plastics are a tool, actually a uh, mechanism, by which these chemicals can adhere to the plastics when they're ingested by fish and corals and other organisms, uh, they can enter into the system and begin to cause the problems there. So I'd like to end my part with just two comments. One is the perspective is, you know, so what about sunscreen at a global level? Um, I was the um, convener for the recent International Coral Reef Symposium that we had here just about two months ago. And you know, I'm pleased to say that the overwhelming message was one of hope and optimism, um, that the window for opportunity to respond to reef stressors is still open. Uh, but when we take a look at what's going on in the world, there's a lot of things piling up that are going against corals and coral reefs. And as a result, it's going against the very people who depend on them as well. And so was uh, sunscreen responsible for uh, 93 percent of reefs in the northern Great Barrier Reef bleaching this year? No. But was it effective in uh, causing problems in the Virgin Islands and in reefs around Hawaii? The answer is yes. So to keep it in perspective, it doesn't mean sunscreen is the only issue, but that's never been what uh, Craig is trying to say. But what is important is it is an issue that we can easily resolve. We can take care of that at the local level, and I believe my other speakers will address that shortly. Um, sometimes people will accuse the scientists, well, you care more about corals and fish than people. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a people issue. Over 500 me uh, million people worldwide depend on corals and coral reefs for their livelihoods, their economy, their culture, and the ecological services, uh, which are um, estimated over $1 trillion in value uh, across the world. And when we lose these ecosystems, we lose all the positive things they do for people. So I'd like to end as a scientist on a very positive note to say, we know that climate change is a huge issue, and that's not something we're going to be able to fix overnight. Um, the good news for you following the news today that Obama and the President of China actually did sign off and agree to the very bold efforts in moving forward to control climate change, that's a huge issue. Um, so while the international community continues to struggle with climate change, we can begin to do things today by just making personal choices. Uh, Craig and I talked about something called a personal footprint. Some of you may be familiar with something called a carbon footprint. You can actually calculate based on your gas use and the 
uh, number of areas you fly to and what you do on a daily basis, what your carbon footprint can be. And what Craig and I talked about is a personal footprint, uh, personal care products. Um, I have a pretty well-stocked chemistry lab in my uh, area where we do our work, but it probably pales in comparison to many uh, people's cos cosmetic drawer. If you look at what you have in terms of personal care products, the chemistry of cosmetics is a very interesting issue. And just by making choices of doing things like selecting sunscreens that do not have chemicals that are harmful, if a million people were to start that today, which is very possible, the improvement in water quality in those areas most impacted could improve overnight. So I'll end my part by simply saying that I am a reef optimist, otherwise I can't get out of bed in the morning. I'm a pragmatist professionally to know that we have a challenge ahead of us, but by dealing with local stressors like this today and continuing to work on the issue of climate change for the long term, I do believe we can leave a legacy of reefs for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. So what uh, we follow up with as managers of the resources are to take the information that people like Bob and uh, science tells us what's happening out in, the, out in the ocean and turn those, that information into messages that we uh, can pass on to the public. And so some of those messages are that we recognize that sunscreens in Hawaii are critical for people's health, so you should continue to use sunscreens. And so it doesn't mean stop all your sunscreens, it says, uh, be careful in the kinds of sunscreens that you do use. So uh, because the sunscreen is important for people's health, you should continue to use them. But one of the things that we want you to understand is that because we are now aware that oxybenzone is potentially a harmful product, and many of the sunscreens have this product, that you should uh, look for this product in your sunscreen if you are going to buy a sunscreen, uh, if it has oxybenzone, um, we recommend that you choose not to uh, so that you don't run into the risk of causing uh, unintended harm to coral reefs and the environment. So if you do have a choice, you want, you want to buy a sunscreen, the recommendation is look at the label and see if it has oxybenzone. If it does not, then it's safe to buy. It, for those people that uh, already have sunscreens and you look at the label and they already have oxybenzene in it, you don't need to throw it away. What we're telling you to do is oxybenzone is detrimental to the coral reefs and to the waters, and so you can still use them if you're going hiking in the mountains or if you're in your backyard. Uh, and so you, know, you can still use those, and then when they run out, then when you purchase new sunscreens, then you choose the reef safe sunscreens. Yeah, so you don't have to get rid of them. Uh, you can still use them, but in the future, look for these ingredients and be more informed as a consumer. Off to you, Jen. Okay. Um, I might take a little, little bit longer. So um, my kind of conservation work is not necessarily building fences um, or planting trees. It would be easier, I think, in some ways. Um, my work is with the public and educating them. When we read the paper provided by Dr. Downs and his colleagues, it became very clear that we had to do something to educate because, uh, as I understand it, 62 parts per trillion is the lethal dose. And the waters inside the natural area reserve, if you're familiar with Ahihikinau on Maui, uh, there was one area where it was 886 parts per trillion instead of 62, which means... <laughs> so that's pretty, that's pretty alarming. And given the bleaching that we had last year and the year prior, I felt like we had to do a lot of education with the public. And we have some challenges I'll share with you. Um, because I've had... This is something we had to kind of wrestle. How are we going to solve this? How do we... We can't tell somebody, you can't put that on. You, you, you can't get in the water now. We can't tell people that. So how do we reach them before they get to the reserve? Um, so myself, I, just to give you some background, myself and one other staff member and 10 volunteers contact roughly 20 to 50% of the visitors who come to the reserve every day. We're getting about 500 people in Ahihi Bay in the ocean every day. So 
even if we upped our game and had lots more people, could we reach all 100%? So many times people say, well, why don't you just do the following thing when they get there? But the, the problem is, once they're at the reserve, it's too late. Um, we're in an area where they can't turn around and go back to the store. They don't want to. They, you know, they're on vacation or it's their day off from work. They don't have a lot of time to go one hour back to Wailea, go find the right sunscreen, then come back. Or they've already put it on. Um, most people, though, don't put it on until they step right out of their car. So, as you, I don't know if you saw the video yet, but we try to approach people as they're getting out, try to come up to them and say, hello, by the way, we're asking you to please choose zinc or titanium oxide sunscreens, the, the good old, actually sunblock, excuse me, good old um, sunblock instead of sunscreen. Um, so, it's kind of problematic. You know, I've often heard people say, why don't you just sell something in the reserve? Well, again, we'd only reach a tiny percent of the people getting in the water. So it was clear that even though the reserve is one small part of Maui, we had to kind of go out uh, and, it, and reach people beforehand. So we're starting, it started to evolve with just a fact sheet produced for the volunteers to help people understand and the volunteers themselves kind of a complex issue. And then um, when we were talking to visitors, they started saying, I can't remember all of those scientific names. Just, just write it down for me. So, okay, this is a shopper's card. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Zinc or titanium on one side, oxybenzone is the top of the list, and there's some other things that are suspect on the back. We're giving out about 50 a day now, about one to a family. Um, and then we realized, you know what? We need some partners in this, so um, we created a poster for dermatologists and for retailers, and I'm happy to say that one of the dermatologists on Maui, probably the biggest clinic, said, yes, I will put these in each of the exam rooms and give me a box of cards so I can give them out. I have a good relationship with my dermatologist, um, and that's one of the messages we wanted to be really clear about. Yes, use a rash guard. Sorry, I have lots of props. Use a big hat. But don't stop protecting your skin. Just choose what you're, you choose carefully what you're going to use. Um, so uh, we also, I've also got uh, Down to Earth is very happy to be the first store on Maui, and we're trying to start a trend where they have personally gone and cleaned their shelves, and now they display the poster and the cards. Um, so we're working with retailers, dermatologists, to help them before they reach um, the reserve. Um, I'll also share that in communicating with visitors, probably the biggest challenge is that people are very, very resistant to read the active ingredient lo um, label. I've, I've been collecting photos on my phone of people who come up and they just hand us the bottle. What about this? And it'll say reef safe on it. You'll flip it over, the very first ingredient will be oxybenzone because there's no agency that regulates what they can say on the front. And so it's been a huge, huge effort to ask people, yeah, put on your reading glasses, I'm over a certain age, and look at the ingredients. This is my favorite brand. I'm not showing you because I'm not promoting a brand. Um, but the same company in a different bottle has the other stuff. This is the zinc titanium stuff, and they have the other stuff. It doesn't matter if you get it at a, I got this at a very prominent health food store chain. And they also had the other stuff. So it's about educating retailers as well as the consumers. But people are very resistant to looking at the active ingredient label. We also try to use a little catchphrase now. We say, if you can't say it, don't spray it. Um, because that's the big one. The new popular thing is to be like the, the video or the movie, Sun. Uh, hairspray, you know, just dance around in the in the cloud. Um, and finally, um, just if we're not around to try to get people's attention, um, oh, I should back up and say that um, we started trying to talk with people, and we found out that most of the visitors buy their sunscreens here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. It's leading into his. Um, so 
we have a chance to change some behavior in other ways if we can't reach them before they get to the reserve. Um, but I'll also share that our other biggest challenge is the it's just me and it's just today attitude. It's just me, it's just today. This really, how much harm is this going to be? Um, took a course eons ago in college about environmental esti in estimation and its purpose, which is not to be exact, but to help you grasp a big problem like climate change and sunscreen use. So I did a little math. Um, let's say 10% of everybody on Maui goes to the ocean every day, conservatively. If it's a hot day, it's more than that. Let's say half of those people, now, you've, now you're talking about 10%, you're talking around, plus visitors, around, around 14,000 to 16,000 people get into the ocean around Maui every day. If, if you're following me, I hope. So about, if, let's say just conservatively that half of those people, only half of those people put on an ounce of sunscreen. That adds up to about one 55-gallon drum going to the ocean one swimmer at a time each day around the island of Maui. And luckily, a ugly old plastic marine barrel washed ashore. So it made the perfect place to display this poster. And that gets a lot of attention because it's a visual. People can see the collective impact. And I think that's probably our biggest challenge, is the, the footprint, the collective impact. Oh, it's just me. This really can't hurt. I do want to protect myself. I'm really worried about skin cancer. So am I. Personally, I've had um, three things sent off to the lab. My dermatologist and I are on a first-name basis. but. There are other al alternatives. Um, and I just want to reiterate, none of us, I'm, I'm certainly not naive enough to think this is going to protect everything, but having seen 30% of the reef die last year was really heartbreaking. And so anything, I think it's imperative that we try to do as much as we can person to person. Um, I have lots of cards if you want to share with friends. You're welcome to them. Um, yeah, it won't change all of it. It won't solve climate change, but if we can check, take this straw off the camel's back, I think that is, that's what we're really about in the reserve, just trying to spread one thing at a time. And hopefully, um, the natural area reserve for visitors and locals, it's a place for them to come and learn so we can spread the word. Aloha and good afternoon to all of you. I first want to say, Thank you for those of you who are not from Hawaii. Uh, thank you on behalf of the state legislature for coming to this World Conservation Congress. We certainly appreciate you being here. And when you see stories and articles in the newspaper or on television about junkets or government officials going to cities or countries for conventions or to gain information, realize that they are very useful. And, and this year, Hawaii, we've been fortunate enough to have um, the, uh, the Coral Reef um, Symposium here. And uh, soon thereafter that, the U.S. Japan Council had a Ocean Conservation Day. And, and then now we have the IUC and World Conservation Congress. And it's through these meetings and discussions and conversations where I and many of my colleagues um, hear from the experts, hear from the individuals who are in the trenches who know much more than we do. And I, by uh, no means, am I a, an expert on the environment, um, but obviously conservation preservation and sustainability you know, are important words within our vocabulary today. And when you look at what came out of the Coral Reef Symposium, um, um, after um, Dr. Craig Downs with the Hereticus Environmental Lab, um, it was so obvious what, what had to be done. You know, Hawaii's number one industry is tourism. So, Eight million people plus, eight million plus come here for our ocean, our coastline, the beaches, the mountains, the streams, uh, 
the beauty of our islands, the people, and the natural beauty as well. And when I heard about the, the effect of oxybenzone on the coral reef, I was just sitting here thinking, it's 2016, it seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> a chemical is hurting your reef. Can we ban it? Can we stop selling it? Can we not have it available to the public? And if we do, are there alternatives? And it's as simple as that. I have the experts to my right here, the scientists, the researchers, the advocates, and they you know, give us the information. And you know, I spoke with many people since then, um, of course with uh, Dr. Downs, um, the university, um, and Dr. Gates, she's with our Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. I reached out with the uh, United States Humane Society, Inga, um, Friends of Panama Bay, uh, Waikiki Aquarium, uh, even the, um, the businesses that sell the alternatives. I mean, they were thrilled <laughs> when they heard about the, the effort and the, the plan. Uh, because there are alternatives. And I, and I believe with those alternatives, that's going to be the key to passing a bill where Hawaii, and we'll hopefully beat California, we are always like to um, look at what California is doing or, or trying to do, and um, they beat us on a few things, we've beaten them, but I think we're, we hope to be the first state in the nation to pass a ban on oxybenzone and, and some other chemicals. There's, there's a lot of other um, benzophenone, hydroxy, xiphenyl, all these fancy words. At the end of the day, though, plain and simple oxybenzone. So I'm working on some draft um, legislation right now. It's almost done. And we begin our session in January. And what I'm hoping is that um, all of you out there keep in touch with us through our state DLNR website or even contact me via the state legislature and submit your testimony and, and let's, let's create this this, this pebble in the pond that will just create a ripple effect and Hawaii, maybe California, other states in the West Coast, Florida, East Coast, and, and then go international with it. Um, there's no reason why it can't. I mean, it, it, this is really, in, in my opinion, a, a rather straightforward, simple objective. Um, you know, we were working on you know, trying to ban um, ivory sales. And boy, that had a lot of challenges and, and obstacles, but we did pass it following New York and California. We're the third state, I believe. And, and we you know, took the leadership on uh, shark fin sales, as many of you may know. Mm -hmm. And now we want to take the lead on this, and um, all my colleagues have said that they've supported it, those I've spoken with. I expect DLNR to jump on board. Even our um, Hawaii Tourism Authority, no reason why they shouldn't. We give them a lot of money, so they better. And, um, and hopefully um, you're going to see the beginning of something that will certainly you know, protect the environment, protect our coral reefs, and, and just leave a, a better um, fingerprint you know, upon our oceans. Thank you.